Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 330. That's 330 with me, your host, Agostino. How's it going? You all right? Great. How am I? Tired, to be honest. Just came back from a three mile run this evening. I'm trying to get the miles in as per usual. Try and do at least minimum of ten, which makes which kind of evens out to about three miles a day, which is not too bad. Um, it's not where I was previously, you know. I was doing the odd five miler here and there, the odd ten here and there, but you know, I'm having to slowly but surely work up to my anabolic threshold or capacity, whatever that term is, so that I can be where I was previously. But you know, it, it, little by little, little by little, we get there. Apart from that, same old shit in it. What else can you say, man? Um, I guess we've got some good news on the workout front. There's been some really good news regarding gyms reopening on the fourth of July. Um, a few videos have kind of come out of like you know some really cool PTs have put videos out detailing exactly how the layout's gonna look like, the kind of protocols that are gonna be put in place. And as you can guess, it's gonna be the tip, the kind of the usual things where. I think everyone's going to get a station. There's kind of marked out areas in the gym that are like two meter distance or around the kind of, uh, yeah, areas that you can kind of basically train in with set amount of equipment allotted to each square. I think some gyms have. Um, and of course, on the bits where it's like the squat rack or whatever it may be, you can't move your bars from a squat rack to a deadlift area. You have to use the specific equipment in that box. Um, and then I think logistically they're gonna have these. I think if you work for if you're a pure gym member, you're pretty be you're. I'm sure you'd be able to just book in advance your sort of like slot or time. But if you go to like a booky one like I do, which is a kind of you know a local council one, you're gonna have to just probably rock up and they'll probably do like a one in one hour or um, a window of time right where you kind of have an hour slot to work out and then they use the time in between to sort of spray shit down or you spray it down actually that makes more sense in it they'll get every yeah so that's looking promising i'm looking forward to that but before we get the show started i thought i'd play a really funny clip that happened over the weekend so to kind of you know loosen the old um what you call it the old mood considering everything else going on in the world so this is a wonderful video that i'm sure most of you guys have probably seen already but let's play it I don't know if you just heard the ending of that interview or part of that interview by Kalechi. Oh, and what he said to you, what he said to you was, there's no spinning this one. There's no spinning this one. I know you always try to be positive, but there is no spinning this one. That was an embarrassing defeat to a team that's down the bottom, struggling to stay in the division. I know teams down there, they'll be fighting for their lives. And you know what I love about Ty on Arsenal Fan TV? They always try and, whenever Arsenal lose, right, in a really embarrassing fashion, they always try their best to, like, um, or especially Robbie, he tries to, like, coax Ty into, like, a, you know, one of the typical DT or, um, what's his face, you know, those, those kind of typical shouty responses, and he never gets into it. He's always just like, I'm not going to support the team. He actually kind of does his, he kind of does his fan cams like a manager. You know, well, you know, we came to the ground, we tried to play our stuff, the boys did well, they put their best foot forward. He tries to do that whole, like, you know, um, monotone, sort of like, you know, sitting on the fence reply, and then he's going to get back into the room and tear them a new one. But you're not the coach, mate, you know what I mean? You're just a player, you're just a fan. <laughs> he never bites, that, he never bites. That is embarrassing. Well, Robbie, Spin I it for me, if you, try and... Well, which try way, if I could do a couple of things first. If I can do this, <coughs> and say Black Lives Matter, and say thank you to NHS. Mo <laughs> I swear, man, this kid definitely gets it. Oh, this sorry, this man definitely gets dropped off at work, man. Like he's something else. In case you're, just, you're not <laughs> watching the video, he. This is a fan cam after Arsenal lost, right? A fan cam essentially where they interview fans after the game, get their views and opinions, and he used his time to not to number one first kneel. Right, um, and do the whole Black Lives Matter fist up in the air. Right, I'm I'm not sure if he's gonna do that for every game or if it's just like a thing, but regardless. And then the next bit is a moth is the funniest bit of the whole interaction. Popo, you are an absolute disgrace. You are a cheat. I hope Brighton get relegated. <laughs> Don't blame it on Mo Don't blame it on. You are a cheat. You are a disgrace. I hope Brighton get relegated. 
Mo no, is a cheat. He's, he's so angry, he can't even get his words out. You know what the funny thing about it is? Like, it's obviously, you know, it's laugh, funny to laugh about it. And Arsenal fans are just a cute gift, the gift that keeps on giving. But if you actually watch the game, the Mope challenge on Burn Leno isn't even that bad. It's a bit of a nothing challenge, right? The ball goes over the top. It sort of bounces heavy, or it sort of bounces twice up in the air. Um, it's the sort of ball where like, the striker thinks he can get it. And the goalkeeper thinks they can catch it before it kind of, you know, leaves the area, leaves the box. Um, he jumps up to go get it. He doesn't know where he's, you know, he doesn't have good spatial awareness in that regard. Murphy sort of leans into him. And as he's falling down, he's in his way and he buckles underneath it, right? It's a, it's a, don't get me wrong. It's a bitch of an injury. He's going to be, it's going to be one of those niggling injuries, you know, to do with ligaments. that's going to, you know, put you out for an annoying period of time. It's the sort of thing that you think, you know, ligaments are those weird things where, when you injure them, you then remember you. It's a stark reminder as to how often you use your ligaments, right? Even in movements that don't essentially are not that obvious to the naked eye, right? So it takes some time to actually get it back to where it needs to get to. But you have to be a lot really patient with the rehab. So don't get me wrong. It's annoying, you know. And Leno is an important player for Arsenal now. You know, with Arsenal being as shit as they are, their best same level what United went through, right? When we were going through our shit period, our best player was David De Gea. So they're going through the same thing too. Ben Leno's their guy, their main, you know, their quote-unquote talisman, which is fucking nuts to say. But he's their Lord and Savior, and he actually, you know, saves, he secures them points or gives them a platform to try and draw and win games. So I get the hysteria, but let's be, let's chill out a little bit. This isn't, you know, this isn't Pogatet some fucking Rodrigo Possible. Do you know what I mean? This is just like an innocuous push in the back, and he accidentally, you know, he kind of like, you know, landed wrong. And that was it, basically. And then in typical Arsenal fashion, they implode. They let it get to their heads. Mopey rattles them. Um, Brighton end up equalising. And then guess what? Right at the death, the guy, the man, the moment, Mopey ends up scoring a really well-taken goal to win the game. In typical Arsenal fashion. And then you got someone like this, right? One of their fans just absolutely going in on Mopey. Like, just mad as hell. Mopai is so a now cheat. Gonna... No, no, Mopai, no, no, no. you are a cheat. You are a cheat. And I, like I said <laughs> again, Mopai, you are a cheat. Come to our dressing room and tell, say, say what you said about our place. Come to our dressing room if you're brave enough. You cheat. Mopai, you are a cheat. And I hope Brian get relegated. Imagine, imagine Mopay getting offered out by Ty and feeling intimidated. What would you think of this, right? It's just, and again, it just adds more fuel to the fire, right? I'm sure other fans. No, not other fans. I'm sure other players from rival teams are going to be watching these things that go viral on social and they're going to be really amped up to try and, you know, essentially turn over Arsenal so they can elicit the same response. And that's what they're going to want to do. If it wasn't already obvious before how people enjoy, you know, may not suffer the same thing. We have teams turning up, like, you know, West Ham's a good example. West Ham get rolled over a week in, week out, and suddenly whenever May United comes to town, they all turn into fucking, you know, uh brazil in the 70s it's fucking annoying but it is what it is what can you do um it's just funny man like you never see ty reacting like this after the game like in response to how badly arsenal played it's always to do with other people the wind the grass was too long the he's just uh he's, he's insane man he literally is insane <laughs> see this is the problem yeah he's more is, no, no, hold, hold on let me say this is the problem yeah you're trying to deflect the blame no, away. No, 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 I'm not deflecting. What, what should have happened to Mope? Should he have been? He should have got a red card. He should have got a red card. card. A red card. Don't be no. For don't be ridiculous. Talking. For the way he's that talking. That was no. Wait a minute. Was that? Be honest now. But I want you to be a hundred percent honest. It's like a little child. Look at him. You're saying that Mope should Mope, have got a red. You're a cheat. You're a cheat, Mope. I was trying to get relegated. Yo, listen. <laughs> <laughs> I love franchise, man. You can't get this type of entertainment anywhere else, honestly. It's the best. They have their, you know, don't get me wrong. Fan channels have their, um, they have their moments where they can get a bit OTT. Essentially, Arsenal fan TV, uh, you know, probably were responsible for Arsenal getting sacked ahead of time prematurely, maybe rightly or wrongly. But you know, now looking back at it, Arsenal wasn't that bad, was he? But all in all, they do give actual fans a voice, and it's cool to see that. But some of the characters they have on this channel, man, it's just out, out of this world. And Ty is one of the, my favorites, actually, even above, even more so than you know the other mainstays. I love Ty because just whenever you think they can, 
whenever you think he can't get more deluded, whenever you think he can't spin something a little bit more, he just surprises you. And that was a big surprise. But yeah, big up time, man, from Arsenal Fan TV. You are a legend, sir. A legend. Anyway, let's move on. What else? I wanted to talk about topics and subjects of things I've seen on the interwebs. Oh, by the way, if it's your first time listening and you like what I'm saying and you want to support the show, ask two things. If you're watching on YouTube, of course, smash that like button and hit subscribe. That's it. And if you're listening via the podcast app, just give it a five-star review and share it with your friends. Nothing more, nothing else. I'm not asking, you know, not asking for your hand in marriage. I'm not asking you to lend me your boxes. I'm not even asking you to, you know, save me some of your gum that you just eating out of your mouth. All I ask you to do is smash that like button, hit subscribe. And if you're listening via the podcast app, five-star review, share it with your friends. That's it. So next on the list here, what else do we have that I want to talk about? Um, getting the bag as a mindset is a bad mindset. So this is um, this is in response to the video that's gone viral of uh, Ja Rule um promoting some Greek um restaurant somewhere in America. Now more details have come out since the story is leaked. Uh, since this uh, video has kind of gone viral um supposedly ja rule is doing this show where businesses pitch their businesses pitch pitch their pain points to him and he kind of puts together some sort of plan of action that's going to get them visibility or whatever it may be um i guess because of his fire festival debacle he's seen as some sort of marketing genius which is a bit of a piss take in some regard because you know he probably is not aware people are laughing at him more than laughing with him but hey you gotta get what you got you gotta do what you gotta do so now the details have come out that supposedly he did this promo for free right he actually was you know i think him and his team reached out to the restaurant wanted to have some help so they put together this skit and they gave him a bit of free promo and judging by the amount of press that's covered it it's basically worked out really well but i have an opposite take on it i still think it's another illustration as to why i think the whole premise around you know getting the bag securing the bag um you know um you know picking up checks whatever those kind of um you know in vogue statements are at the moment about making sure you get paid and being an entrepreneur i think they're a bit flawed i think there is such a thing as bad money like you know people say oh all money is good money i don't believe that or it's that all attention is good attention i don't believe that either i think you would much rather have um the money i don't know i, I look at it similar to like influencers there was a period in time where um, influencers well especially in the beginning when they weren't called influencers when they were just people that kind of you know maybe moved culture in some way shape or form from their little platform that they had or small audience they had usually it's because they were promoting or big up stuff that they actually used and they actually supported day in day out and if and usually they were trying their best to get the attention of those brands and not being successful at it right the brands would ignore them they don't really see the value in it and then it got to a point where um it was just obvious that the influencers were actually um adding to the bottom line of these businesses more so than their big glitzy advertising campaigns and billboards and celebrity endorsements and maybe as well because of the metrics you know the the, sorry, the analytics it's a lot easier to actually track um how much value an influencer is bringing to your company brand service whatever than it may be to see how impactful a billboard was to your bottom line you know you can actually follow the link and see how many people click that link i did i to basket did a successful checkout blah 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 so it might be part of it but i think they were, then it somehow just changed where it went from being that and then it went from being that kind of influencer to then being an influencer who is kind of um, a reluctant one right if you have a big enough following even for myself i have like what two thousand followers or something right on instagram and even i get you know um even even i do sometimes get random emails from shitty companies selling you know some bootleg apple headphones or some shitty watch or something trying to get me to post it on my feed to get you know x amount of pounds or to get something off or to keep the item whatever maybe so as soon as it went from the brands reaching out to influencers to get some sort of exposure it changed the game because then influencers were just you know they were um they were essentially putting themselves off for sale right whoever was the highest bidder could get their endorsement get their sort of like they could attach their ip towards a, 
on top of the brand and sometimes it damages your IP or it damages your brand integrity um, or your brand image, whatever that word is, right? It, it's not really a good thing. And I think Ja Rule's suffering from the same thing from what we've seen from the debacle at Fire Festival to him trying to put together another festival to him trying to restart the app. He's just been, you know, it's just been a public L after L. And it's funny because these public Ls, it could be completely different than private. It could be that he's, you know, doing some really big moves behind the scenes that we're not aware of. But, you know, in the court of public opinion, perception is key, right? You want to be perceived one way. And he's just not perceived as cool anymore at all. And it's really sad to see, considering I grew up on Ja Rule, right? Um, hearing these songs and house parties and stuff. And it's just so weird how an artist can just dive, can suddenly go from being, you know, cool and red hot. Not get me wrong. Maybe some of his songs were corny, but he was never looked at as like an uncool dude. Um, you wouldn't, you know, his songs might have been a bit annoying after a while, but he didn't think he was not cool. And now I think a lot of kids coming up, I was looking at him and thinking, this guy's a bit of a dork. But what can you do? And here's, let's watch the video so we can get a bit of a context to it. But this is the actual video that was going all over the place on Twitter. Let it load up. Come on, son. Ba, 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 ba. Come on, son. It's not loading the quickest today. Maybe the internet, maybe it's the abundance of windows. Who knows? Okay, let's see here. It's finally loading. Yep, I think so. I'm still gonna, gonna defecate. There you go, it's murder. Boom. Let's get this up on here. This is for Papa Christo's Greek Deli. It make you wanna slap your mama. Pop Christo's got the best motherfucking gyros, gyros. You ever f***ing ate your life so good? Take one, let think of mm, You got to have Peter's, Peter's, Pop Christo, Peter's. They got everything. I'm gonna just give you a rundown of some of my favorites. They got taz taziki. I, uh, hold on, octopi tequila. Well, uh, whatever, but it's good. I, I will. <laughs> Apple lime mono soup, copper pizza, and they got wine too. I'm telling you. And it's not, you know, don't get me wrong, it's not a bad thing, but it's a thing that I, it kind of always grates me a little bit when you hear some of these ad reads on podcasts and they clearly have no idea what is sponsoring their podcast. They're just reading it out and fumbling the words and mispronouncing shit. And clearly just, you know, have not invested any time trying to understand or research a product that they're trying to advertise for people to click on. I guess in some respects, it's, there's a quite an ironic humor to it, right? The fact that they just, they managed to swindle a brand out of a bag so that they can just get sponsored. And that they hope that they're making it so obvious to their audience that they clearly don't give a fuck because they've already been paid, right? Because most of these um, advertising brand placements you get on a podcast or you get on a YouTube show usually they pay you a little bit of an upfront fee you get something before you even advertise it um and then of course you get some add-ons on top right if you're able to you know convert a certain amount of people blah 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 blah, blah. some you know terms and conditions are met you can get some more money but you've already been paid you've already got the chunk of your money so anything on top is a bonus and you're not really incentivized to push it that hard um but it just runs me out the wrong way you know it doesn't matter i know really and truly but come on if you're gonna promote a Greek deli at least try and pronounce the words right or if you're gonna pick some things that you you say your favorite things just pick a couple of things that are your favorite things for sure you've eaten something on that menu before in all his life being you know a very successful hip hop artist I'm sure he's been to like some cuisines that have served that kind of food before or some restaurants sorry, that served that kind of cuisine before I'm sure he has so to just be willfully unaware and ignorant of it is a bit rubs me up the wrong and again it's just another indication of just um, just how much of a shit show that fire festival thing was, isn't it? And that's a good. That's just not not. I'm fed to bring it up now, but it's like, God damn it! Come on down to Papa Cristo. You can't even pronounce the food. It's so damn good. Show them what you working with, Papa. Show them how you do it. Hey, yeah, Papa. Hey, where are you, Papa Cristo? Are funny. you here, Papa? Papa, Papa Cristo, are you here? Come on down to Papa Cristo, two seven seven one West Boulevard, Pico. Oh. You can call right now and get it delivered. Poppy Cristo, ooh, make you want to do the thing. Opa! 
cringe, man. Like, I guess you could say he probably doesn't need the money, and if he's doing it as like an, you know, um, as his kind of, you know, his philanthropy thing for the year, fair play, right? If he's just been the cool dude, but you can't deny this looks really bad, isn't it? Like, it's just what are you doing? Um, of course, it gives someone at like fifty a, a sworn enemy of Jar Rule, more enemy, more sorry, more ammo. Um, to point towards him but maybe as well from Jaru's side he probably just doesn't really give a shit this is part of his new personality that he's developed where he's kind of gone through the whole fire festival debacle and he's sort of developed a thicker skin now where he's sort of kind of because that's a good thing to be honest right if he's able to sort of take what he learned from fire festival and how the you know social media can quote unquote cancel you or make you or judge you i don't know is it cancel whatever that word is that happened to him and if he's able to lean into it and just kind of play up the fact that he's a bit of a doofus, right? Like he's a lovable oaf, that might work out for him. But if he's generally trying to be like, you know, Mark Cuban, right? And he's trying to kind of broaden his portfolio and be this businessman when we clearly know he hasn't got the brains for it, right? Um, and it's not a sad indictment, right? Not everyone could be an entrepreneur. It's not as if like, you know, I don't know, entrepreneurism, entrepreneurism, or entrepreneurs or the whatever that term is that you describe people that want to do that thing um has it's gone through a weird little phase and it? it's not even a phase it's been a few years now where suddenly it's turned into like wanting to become a basketball player or something right it's turned into one of those sort of things where no one can really tell you you can't do it until you can't do it right that's the kind of thing like you can say you want to be in the nba but until you get to a point where everything is pointing towards a direction that you just haven't got it that's when you stop but no one can no one you know it's a bit unfair to tell somebody they can't do a thing you gotta let them try and i guess entrepreneurism is the same thing but there's so much at risk with being an entrepreneur right money time that you just can't get back right money you can get back but time you can't um mental health there's a lot of things that will you know fall by the wayside trying to pursue a business or to run several businesses at the same time especially in the area or field that you're not an expert at right and i'm sure ja rules not an expert in restaurants so that's the interesting part of it um but you know again he maybe doesn't take himself too seriously maybe it's all laughing jokes to him but it's just sad to, for my me personally being a fan of his music um to see somebody that i deemed as being cool when i was in school just turn into an absolute cornball but hey what can you do moving on what else we have here we have uk driving gigs i think i mentioned this previously but i think there's a new story popping up now regarding uh pacific gigs happening in the uk because i think the story that i mentioned on the previous episode was to do with um them springing up all over the world now the the, the premise behind having a a driving gig it's pretty simple right you know with lockdown um uh with lockdown still being the thing in most of the parts of the world right not many places maybe apart from a couple of countries have come out of lockdown um but most places are in some kind of lockdown that's restricting people from going out and mingling in social areas such as bars and clubs and concert halls so promoters are getting you know creative and trying to figure out ways that they can get people to go out and see their favorite artist and sort of like you know experience that sort of live music feel and i think they've done it in america i think burt christ is a comedian i saw trialing doing a little driving stand-up comedy tour there's djs doing it in some parts of europe but this is the first sort of indication we're going to see that they're going to do it here in the uk now the weird thing about doing it in the uk is that usually in my experience from what i know again i don't drive so i don't know if this is an underground culture thing but there aren't many places that you can go to in the uk where they do sort of driving entertainment it's not a thing we have here i know people used to go on um what's those little camping trips used to go people my some of my friends went on where they sort of like is that butlins where you go with your van your parents take you with your van you park up and then you sort of like station there and there's little tents or buildings that the kids can go in and have fun and there's adult areas as well i think i don't know i think it's buttons right those kind of places so those like, they exist in the uk they're very popular especially outside of london but the experience of going into like a car park somewhere and there being a massive screen and you're watching you know uh, a 70s movie or whatever else and a you know whatever that thing is doesn't really exist you know it's sort of the scene you'd picture in american cinema right the car the amazing cadillac from like the, you know the 60s pulling up to a driving um cinema place somewhere and these star-crossed you know romantic lovers 
um, you know, kissing, you know, with their shadows sort of like in the distance. That's a thing you'd remember from like a, an American cinema. You don't really mention it. It's not really something you see in UK places. So it's a bit strange to see them kind of pushing it here. But again, I think these promotion companies have lost so much money over the period of COVID-19. They're just trying anything, anything they can to try and scrape together some pennies right to try and make things worthwhile and obviously to make sure the company stays around so that when full lock so when full lockdown is lifted they can you know still be left standing so this article from bbc detailing it it says plans for a uk-wide driving gigs announced it says a series of driving concerts that take place across the uk this summer promotes live nation of now so that's a big big play in the game the likes of Ash, Dizzy Rascal, The Lightning Seeds and Gary Newman have all signed up to play at the Live from the Driving events. Outdoor spaces in Birmingham, Liverpool and London will play host as well as the Edinburgh, Bristol and beyond. The 300 car gig have been designed to provide a safe alternative to many of the events uh, that have been cancelled. The concert series which has also featured the streets and Tony Hadley will run from mid-July to September until music venues continue talks with government about how and when they might reopen in the wake of COVID-19. Now, from what I've read, all indications point towards there being no live events with mass groups of people until a vaccine is found, basically. Um, everything that I've read online so far about the virus, you know, we all know the same information, you know. It's, it's an airborne virus, spreads via droplets, and it kind of is exasperated. It's, um, the effects are exasperated, yeah, the effects of it right is that the effects of the term whatever that term is um when you are in a closed environment where people are shouting or talking very loudly that's why they they propose if you're going to be on public transport where face coverings keep to be distance two meters distance apart whatever social distance and also make sure you don't talk too much um so i can't imagine governments being okay with green lighting people um gathering on mass unless you're like an american government right but gathering on mass to attend a concert with COVID-19 still around. It's just not worth the risk, especially to putting yourself at the crosshairs of liability unless you get people to sign waivers or stuff before they get in the place. But I don't think it'll stop people from, you know, from suing if they end up falling ill or worst comes to worst, God forbid somebody ends up passing away as a, you know, as a consequence of going to your event. So everyone's saying no live events until next year uh, or until a vaccine is found. So you can understand the desperation from them to do this sort of thing here. But it continues. The article it says, uh, more than 400 grassroots venues are facing permanent closure according to the Music Venue Trust. Bloody hell. Um, it has warned the UK government that an immediate cash injection of 50 million is needed to prevent mass closures in July, August and September. The organisation also called for a one-off uh, cut in the VAT on ticket sales for the next three years and is running a campaign to raise money for threatened venues. Initiatives such as the virtual festival in Bristol this weekend, which artists at Labyrinth, no, I'm sorry, Lady Smith, Black Mond, Ma what? Lady Smith, Black Mambuza, and Beth Rowley aiming to hit 20,000 donations. Who's who's really going to be performing at a driving gig? It's not going to be anyone you want to see, right? I love Dizzy, right? That first album, Boy in the Corner, is one of my, you know, go, will go down the history as one of the greatest albums of all time, but. Are you really trying to see a digital article gig in general? I'm not. And would you want to see him in your car for a screen somewhere? I don't. I wouldn't either. So the people performing are the ones that no one wants to see, right? The absolute dregs of the entertainment world in the UK. And then the people going, are they just bored? Or is it just a thing of like, fuck it, why not? Which is the same thing really. But I don't see what would possess me to go to a, a car park somewhere in the UK to go and see someone play, especially oh just just before by us now, we have some of the worst um noise pollution laws, you know, this side of Europe, mate. Do you know what I mean? Most festivals in the UK the sound is horrendous unless you're in the middle of nowhere. There's always putting limiters on it, cancels complaining, it's not the best thing. So I don't know what are they going to relax the license the sound pollution limitation for the venues that are hosting this sort of thing. Um I wonder how they're gonna get around all that sort of stuff. Like um, it continues, it says, reimagine the live experience. Said, live Nation is one of the UK's biggest concert promoters and owns venues like Cardiff's Motor Point Arena and London's Brixton Academy, which are unlikely to open their doors before the end of the year. See, told you. Um, the company's share prices fell from $75.60 pounds to $29.23 pounds in March. That is, I don't know anything about stock, but I'm assuming 
and falling more than half of your value in one month isn't a good thing um in march as a lockdown took hold although the figure is now hovering above 50 to 40 to 50 it still hasn't recovered fully it says driving concerts with limited audiences will not necessarily reverse their fortunes but promoters peter taylor said the company was excited to help live music resume yeah right peter taylor wants to keep his job <laughs> it says here the concert the other concert series was created as a way to reimagine the live music experience during a time of social distancing by allowing fans to enjoy concerts in the safest possible way yeah i guess man again you can count me out of it i i would i would much rather um attend i'd much rather get carl cox to dj in my living room right with his big smiley face then go somewhere like that like no thank you and you know i'd be tempted to throw an eye in like carl cox's head as he's djing so imagine me trying to go to like a driving gig it's just not gonna happen it's not the vibe but hey what do i know next one let's what else do we have here to talk about let me get some of this stuff off here before we continue do 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 okay what else we have here on the list oh talking about places being open we have an update regarding pubs that's a good thing that's another big news so if not on top of the gym to go update regarding pubs so um there's a consortium of pubs and bars on social media that have come together and are basically saying look we don't care we're gonna open on the 4th of july right they're not they're not waiting around for the government to give them instructions because they feel as if the government are you know they're uh they're twiddling their thumbs or twiddling their thumbs right they're sitting on their hands they're not really being proactive which we've seen most governments do around the world right people are quick to close down quick to lock up but then they don't really have a scooby of what to do when it comes to reopening or restarting the economy so bars and restaurants are taking it within their own hands and saying we're going to reopen because if we stay closed for another month we could essentially go under right there's no way they can survive another month with you know thin on the ground income coming in through delivery services which you know some restaurants aren't even equipped to do anyway so they're just completely losing money so i get it so um this is sort of like uh, imagining what will happen and what the scenario is going to be like this is an article from BBC again. It says, when will pubs, bars, cafes and restaurants reopen? Pubs, bars and cafes, restaurants in England may soon be able to reopen their doors for the first time since lockdown began in March. On Tuesday, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is expected to confirm the hospitality sector can reopen on 4th of July, which I'm not sure if that's like a thing that's happened as a consequence of the pressure from the bar owners or if it's a date they always had in mind. Um, either way, interesting to see how they're going to spin that one tomorrow. He said, Mr. Johnson is also expected to announce uh, a two meter social distancing in England to be relaxed with more con some conditions. But despite the easing of restrictions, a trip to a local bar or place to eat could be a very different experience from the, how it was before the outbreaks. So here's it says, how um, when will it begin? When will it begin? It's going to begin the 11th. Uh, it, the plan was published on the 11th of May. And what are the rules now? said on 20th of march all pubs and bars and restaurants were asked to shut in order to stop the spread of coronavirus the only exceptions to that were cafes and canteens at select few spaces at, such as schools and hospitals and prisons since then many restaurants have started offering food delivery um, and takeaways in order to uh, generate income while their doors are closed some pubs have also been allowed to offer takeaway beers which you know the selective thing is a bit annoying and like i mentioned before some restaurants just aren't set up to do deliveries or takeaways right um they need um oh, sorry deliveries or collections they they sort of need passing trade to make it work um they continue to say what about the rest of the uk each nation set its own rules or the, what the main look of the reopening so it was made, okay it's new measures um new measures at the weekend health secretary hancock suggested people visiting pubs may have to register before going for a pint which is absolutely nuts but hey is it, it was it'll be a real test about how much you want to drink in it well you, are you willing to sign all your privacy and have the government be aware of every time you enter a boozer or you know um the article continues here it says um he said the government is looking at ways to strengthen contact tracing as the economy reopens the mexican restaurant oaxaca says it's considering a range of measures to keep staff and workers safe customers are likely to be given the option of ordering food on the apps while the staff will be encouraged to wash their hands every 20 minutes if if you know if working a service job wasn't annoying as it was right having to deal with customers and annoying you know authoritarian power hungry managers imagine having them and the customers demand that you wash your hands 
it's already bad enough, right, with those fucking Karens that go around, you know, complaining that somebody touched something and touched the other thing. You know, those kind of people, the ones that are looking in the kitchen and seeing if hygiene standards are being kept. Imagine now them being aware of this. I can imagine a lot of fights. Um, it says here, look, your hospitality industry is the third largest employer in the UK. Madness, 3.2 workers in that sector. 3.2 million, sorry. Um, what the country's done. So, um, another one of the kind of additions they said with the pubs, I don't think they mentioned this article, but there was another one where they were saying that um, they will introduce a law or a temporary license, yeah, temporary relaxing of the licensing laws so that pubs could allow people to drink outside. Because if you don't, if you don't have a beer garden, you're basically fucked during lockdown, isn't it? You need to have, um, in order to get people in. So if you're not able to have people in your beer garden because you don't have one, you can also have people standing outside in the street, which is a great addition, I think. So let's see, man. Um, Fourth of July couldn't come sooner. I think it's a good thing going forward, like I mentioned previously. I think people need to take their minds off what's happening in the world. I don't think it's healthy for, you know, I don't think it's healthy or productive for general public to be worried about how to sort out an issue such complicated as systemic racism or police reform right these are things that should be um left to the experts to sort of like handle and then we can vote on what the best idea is once they're done but for people on social and stuff to be you know so caught up with this especially just because they have nothing else to do um it's a waste of time in my opinion um i think they could be best served being supporters and cheerleaders as opposed to driving these things but hey what do i know but i, I do think once these pubs are reopened you're going to see a drastic decline in the amount of people going out and protesting but it's a good thing though because the people left protesting the people left kind of putting up the good fight will be the ones that you want to be there right they're the people that are protesting week in week out they're the ones that are at outside of parliament square shouting and raving on the weekends and stuff and handing out leaflets and zines so I think we'll be in good hands once everyone goes back to shopping, goes back to getting a haircut like myself and goes to the gym, goes to a bar. I think we'll actually be in a far better... We'll, we'll, there's a chance that we might live in a far better world after the fact, I think so. Um, next on the list here, what else do we have? What's wild? Oh. Yeah, I've touched upon that a little bit. Let's talk about it just briefly because I don't, I don't know, I don't really know the details, and I think it's, it gets a bit weird talking about women's stuff on here because you know, I'm not a woman, and I have no experience about what they're actually going through, especially when it comes to scene industry shit in it. But let's try and tackle this. So, um, it seems like you know, with lockdown, there seems to be a prevalence of uh men in the entertainment industry being exposed uh for some sort of you know sexual abuse sexual assault uh i don't know manipulation whatever men are in you know men are in some hot bother especially the ones that have been operating in the shadows i guess because people have been you know they're not around they're not out and about you've got time to ruminate think about what that person did wrong to you and of course in the case of crystalia you know the girl was sitting at home bored watching you and she had no idea he was on the show and she started like ranting on social and then suddenly it completely blows up so it's um it's a rough time to be a dude if you have been shit to women over the last few years isn't it and another good example of this is this lady called ray black who i'm not very familiar with i have to be completely honest but she came out on social and essentially um let everybody know that a uk rapper called ambush allegedly um did some things to her that were not that appropriate and it got me thinking right it got me thinking why is it that in the entertainment world specifically why is there such a maybe maybe it's a wrong question to ask but it seems that there's a real lack of gentlemen in that scene especially considering the abundance of attractive women that exist in that scene that are single and ready to mingle right it's not as if there's a lot of frigid girls in the sort of entertainment music scene right they're all trying to make it they've all got dreams and hopes and desires and they're all very much aware of the industry they're in right they're aware of how superficial it is how shallow it is and they don't mind playing a game just be nice isn't it so that's the thing that's always kind of disturbing when you hear these stories especially when it's especially when it has to do with people that work with are in the same field right singer rapper rapper sing rapper like this you're, you're doing the same thing so there should be a bit of a brotherhood for lack of a better term right um that must exist right it's sort of like kinship uh support system right because you're all artists you know what you're going through again it's it's a bit of a 
um, idealistic way to look at things. I'm sure if you're a successful person, you don't want to be hanging around with someone that's just on the come up trying to make it because they might, you know, damn your, they might kind of um, ruin your vibe and shit. But in general, there should be a little bit more camaraderie. And I guess that's what makes this story a bit hurtful because it seems like one person was treated as less than that and the other person was putting themselves on a pole, on a sort of like, you know, above on a pulpit or something, looking down. So there's this weird sort of power dynamic going on. But again, just read, just kind of read the story in a minute, but just why is there such a lack of gentlemen, man? If you're single and out there doing your thing and you're a dude, why can't you just be cool to girls so that they can, you know, have good things? That's the thing I wonder, especially in the UK scene. I'd imagine it's, you know, with uh, us living on a small island, I'd imagine the scene's pretty small too. So word gets around if you're a douchebag. So wouldn't you want your name to ring out in a good way so that when you're spoken about, people speak about you in a way that, oh, it's such a great experience. I'm gutted I couldn't make it work out. Um, but like, I don't know, whatever. Something along those lines as opposed to like, oh, this guy, you know, groped me whilst I was walking through a busy fucking convention somewhere, as this story kind of points out. Allegedly, of course, you know, because, you know, don't want to get in trouble. But hey, this is a tweet. So this is from uh, this lady called Ray Black. Said, I changed my mind. Time's up. First screenshot says, uh, please read this message in its entirety to understand the context of this event, which we intend to do. Oops, get up here again. Context of this event. Um, in February, I attended a amazing YouTube event to bring the culture together, which was sadly ruined when I was sexually assaulted by Ambush World. Uh, that is a that the she went right she you know came out hot um previously i met ambush only on one occasion very briefly where a friend introduced me to him and we said hi very casually and quickly and although he was very clearly undressing me with his eyes during this but i thought nothing of it because i have no problem with somebody looking at me and finding me attractive however that was the extent of our conversation slash meeting slash dialogue i have ever had with ambush so I guess that's already a, a warning sign if you're a girl, maybe, right? I guess you'll just probably be caught off guard, but that's already a big red flag. If you meet someone the first time and it's just pure, it's just like, you know, it's key in ignition and it's just pure sex at the beginning, there's probably a reason, it's probably a, a good reason for you to stay away, right? Or to kind of be on your P's and Q's. Um, again, especially a scene event. We're not talking about somebody meeting somebody in a club, right? And being introduced as, oh, this is my girl. Yeah, I told you about her, right? And you're not really hearing it properly. You're just looking at her. You're, you've, got, you've got a few bevies in you. You're just trying to be, a, you know, Rico Suave. That's one thing. But to be, you know, introduced to somebody at an event that's to do with the industry, that's to do with music and to do with, you know, bringing artists together and shit, you would have expected to be a little bit more, I don't know, professionalism, right? A little bit more tact towards it. If you're going to address it with your eyes, maybe have some glasses on. I don't know. Just something to kind of make the experience as less awkward as it, may, as it can be possible but i guess in the eyes of somebody like him right who's doing the looking and the eye undressing i guess from a boy point of view maybe he just expected it to work because it always worked right maybe that whole move undressing with your eyes next time i see you it's on tops that works for some people but then he um, unfortunately met a girl that wasn't about that life and didn't want any you know just completely non plus about him so it continues it says the next time i saw him i was at this youtube event i was hanging my coat up when he entered and when i said hi to him he said hi and then proceeded to aggressively grab and shake my breast saying "Ra, you look nice and carried on walking away which is an insane thing to do in it again i just it beggars belief just how she like you know similar to the crystalia story of like you know it was a well-known fact with crystalia that he was a bit of a ladies man right which is odd as well, considering in the which is like you know it was an odd thing, especially in the com in the stand up comedy world. Most stand up comedians, um, you know, they don't look like Crystalia, right? They just look like dudes. So um, you generally have a, a heavily male audience, right? Mostly middle age, but you don't really get like Crystalia fans, which happen to be you know Instagram girls from the age of like seventeen, eighteen to like you know twenty five. That's not really a thing that most comedians get. So. There should be no excuse for him trying to solicit younger girls than that because he's already got quite young girls coming up to him after the show quite clearly wanting to suck his pee pee right it's a thing he does so i guess in this case if you're this rapper 
you would assume there's some level of clout in the same way that influencers get you know propositioned by shitty headphone brands to promote them on their feed there has to there has to exist a group of girls out there if that's what you're interested in who just you know who just want to get with you regardless just because they saw you on fucking the internet that must exist as well so that should satiate that should sort of um, appease some of your lustful desires you shouldn't be that horny really should you that's what i mean basically should you be that horny that active especially with somebody who's quite clearly wanting to be your peer they don't want to be like uh i don't know from what she's saying there wasn't any flirting before it was just like you know i met you i'm an artist you're an artist we're in a scene i'm in a scene and it just escalates especially to that extent it's just like so brazen it's un- which kind of makes you wonder as well is he behind the scenes being enabled like is that sort of thing that happens everywhere because for for sure if that was one of my friends and i happened to see that like i'd have a word do you know what i mean that's not something that i'd be cool with or be laughing about i think that's funny so maybe in that circle of people it's sort of a thing that gets done i don't know um it continues it says i was shocked and taken back i wasn't even sure what i thought would happen what i thought happened was real so I walked back to him, generally thinking, surely that didn't happen. And I asked him, hey, did you just grab my breast over there? To which he replied, what can I, what can I, uh, what can I say? I saw your breasts and they were looking nice. Jesus Christus. At that point, my blood was boiling and I realized if I addressed this in the manner I wanted to right there, I would have turned into, I would turn that incredible positive YouTube event completely upside down. Not wanting to be painless and aggressive or crazy black woman to people who has zero context, I decided to walk away. So I did, so I said, okay, tomorrow we'll talk about this. That's happened too often, isn't it? Especially with black people in the entertainment world, man. How many times have I been, well, a couple of times I've had, I've had some skirmishes, right? I've had some flare ups where someone's tried to like stick it on me or try and be aggressive, then I've had to answer back. But unfortunately, those scenarios, as she's mentioning, no one sees the context, especially because I get when I, you know, when I flip, I, I, I don't really have a kind of a, a lever to kind of pull me back that easily. So whenever someone's walking past and see me getting aggressive and really getting irate, I just look at the crazy dude that's just starting on people, right? I look at the aggressor and, the, and I'm a bigger guy. So it just, it doesn't come across well. The optics are never good. It's either you just watch the guy quickly, right? When no one sees, right? A quick couple slaps, bam, bam, bang, and just get the job done. Or you just walk away and sort of like have your ego get dented. So I guess that's one part of it, right? You have to somehow dismiss or put your ego to one side, which I guess women are a lot easier, or a lot better at doing than men right they can sort of like put their ego to one side and sort of like you know swallow the temporary temporary embarrassment and then as per this text or this sort of um note they're able to like swallow the temporary embarrassment and then get you back double or triple fold later on down the line you know as a, as was the bible says um no vengeance there's nothing like a woman scorned she's not really scorned but you know you know what i mean he continues says the next day i sent him a message telling him that what he did was totally unacceptable um to which he replied my bad i came back and told him that just wasn't good enough considering he was sexually assaulted a fellow artist he then eventually switched it up and started telling me why are you getting on me for i'm a flirty guy in it why are you saying words like that oh my god this guy um i'm not a pervert you should allow me saying to somebody you're not a pervert you should allow me is probably the quintessential thing somebody a pervert would say in it like it's like um, when people say, I swear I'm telling the truth. I swear my mom's life. You're probably lying, isn't it? Through your teeth and your mom's already dead. For sure. So for him to, yeah, it's just, like I said, man, you'd hope there'd be like a little bit of a fraternity around artists, right? Like, n- not to say that you can be a scumbag to groupies as well, because I don't think that's a thing. Especially after reading some of the books by... Um, there's a Steven Tyler book I actually have at the moment, which I've I finished from before, but an autobiography Steven Tyler put together. What's the title of it? It's over there. Oh, I can't read it, but anyway, um, where he saw details, you know, coming up in a scene and the amount of groupies they got back in the day. And it was a thing with rock stars, right? Where they purposely went to play in certain cities just so they can hook up with young girls. But part of the process was to just be nice to them, right? So sometimes you'd return to the city and you want to meet the same girl that you were, you were with last year on tour. So it helps if you're nice to them because then 
by the year, by that time, by the time you come back again, there might be some new girls on the scene that they can introduce you to, right? So it kind of serves your purpose. They get to hang out with the star and you get obviously to hang out with them. So it's mutually beneficial. So I th that's why I could never understand this whole like, oh, let me just be shitty to somebody. Treat him like dog shit. Um, you know, and have no concept of thinking, you know, she has friends who are also artists, people that might actually have actually liked you more than she did, who might want to hook up with you and then they hear this story and they just, you know, they completely write you off. Business deals that you don't have no idea that she could be connected to that could possibly be damaged by it. It's just a complete shit show. And just in general, just human to human. Like, come on. You know what I mean? Um, there's enough Beckys in your fucking DMs for you to like, you know, fondle and have some fun with without, you know, disparaging a young black woman trying to make in a scene. But again, what do I know? It continues. It says, um, uh, I'm not a pervert. You should allow me one of the worst lines ever. I'd say for that one. But it says, uh, bearing in mind, I do not know this man. She says, even if I did, there's still no excuse. But before you people start victim shaming or asking what I did or what I wore, bear in mind, I do not know this man from anywhere. We have never engaged in any flirty. Whoever's thinking there should be, vi yeah. Anyway, let's continue. We never engaged in any. Uh, flirty conversation or relationship nothing and he thought it was acceptable to grab in such an intimate part of my body and then get angry at me for calling him out that's a classic move in it that scumbag zoo something that you saw stevie J do a lot on, on um love and hip-hop right that ability to like and even joe budden as well when these more toxic years right where he was able to somehow um turn an accusation against him into some sort of psycho psycho analysis of the woman that was involved somehow turning the tables making them question their sanity right um it's a fucking masterful skill when you're watching it on tv but of course going through it as a woman must be fucking terrible especially when you legitimately have a grievance here right like no i felt your hands on my breasts i know you did um yeah and he's trying to convince you otherwise it must be mad um, it continues here. It says, sadly, I've not spoken about this since it happened in February because a friend who I no longer sit there, a friend told me we should be practicing. We should be protecting a black man and not damaging his career. Jesus Christ. Imagine having a friend like that. No words, man. Like the, the amount of violence I'd enact on a friend that said that to me would just not be, you couldn't describe it. It continues. It says, and that potentially... Um, other male artists won't want to fuck with me um, if I come out and talk as well oh, sorry if I come out and talk as I'll seem like somebody who starts creating problems imagine getting sexually assaulted and then you being accused of stern problems my word um, I'm no longer worried about any of the uh, above because I really don't care anymore my image of my career being liked or supported by male artists doesn't mean anything to me whatsoever if it means that much as a predator is allowed to continue doing things like this agreed I'm a woman I support and defend women and will never be part of the problem and allowing men like this to continue I've been scared what's that problem to continue i've been scared worried and, and conscious of how this may taint me or my music in the future particularly if i choose to make sexy music or appear in sexy fashion that's just ridiculous shouldn't be even something she needs to say but i guess you've got to put it out there innit? like that idea that oh because you put you put your goods out there that somehow men are uh, have free permission to go and touch you up is just insane that's only a creeper an absolute scumbag will say something like that i think actual reasonable folk would never uh, expect that from anybody um, it continues it says um, but I won't be victim shamed I don't give a shit about anything 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 anymore by speaking up telling the truth and empowering other people to use their voice too seeing everything on time today seriously triggered me and I won't allow you and whoever will support you to make me silent in fear oh she said it, it? she fucking said it and yeah so again sad situation all around I'm not sure how it's going to be dealt with I'm not sure if we're going to get any reply from Ambush. What can you reply with, really, to these kind of allegations? How can you really correct it when you've clearly not taken it seriously from the beginning? But hopefully it's a teachable moment for guys out there in the scene, isn't it? If you're going to be... If you're going to try... I would advise against, obviously, trying to hook up with your fellow artists, right? Just so you could, you know, uh, protect yourself and ensure that the scene is just healthy. I don't know. I think everyone hooking up in the scene can sometimes make things a little bit weird. But if you are gonna hook up with somebody from the scene, they're a fellow artist. Treat them with some dignity and respect, innit? Don't chat shit. 
you know don't disparage their name don't talk bad about them and again some boys do that they get into that sort of catty thing where they start gossiping about girls and what they go up to and stuff that's not what gentlemen do right gentlemen don't kiss and tell so all those things just try and avoid it because it's not it's not cool it's not warranted it's not needed and especially in this era where uk music is sort of like on the amount is sort of on the ascendancy and we have loads of different artists making loads of different types of music and especially girls right we have loads of girls who are really talented coming up I and mean, back in the day in grime there'd be like you know a couple of light-skinned girls singing and a few butch looking mc girls rapping and that was it i mean it's spitting that would be that'll be it now we have loads of different people representing loads of different sort of sides of the black experience in the uk the last thing we need is for these people to feel like they're in danger when they're entering these spaces right they have to feel as if like they're not safe we don't want that we want everyone to feel safe um we want to be able to police ourselves in that kind of regard we don't need an outside person to come and tell us what we're doing is bad or it's not good right we know it's not good we shouldn't be practicing those kind of things or encouraging it in any way shape or form again i'm not a fan of people getting cancelled and you know core public opinion and shit but you have to address this man you have to say something yeah you know i mean you can't be just letting yeah you can't especially when someone brings up i think because she she went above and beyond right to kind of tell him in private hey you did this thing to me this wasn't cool and you could use that moment to apologize profusely and make amends but that arrogance man it's just mad isn't it mad 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 but hey hope it gets sorted for ray black in general because you know brave woman for speaking out about it credit to you anyway let's move on what else we got here ibifa is not gonna reopen in it that's a sad one so i guess there was there was hope slim hope thin yeah slim hope that ibifa was gonna um reopen in time to save people's summer i've been annoyed by this whole like save our summer campaign anyway it's really really done my head in but i get where the sentiment comes from right lockdown has been a pretty stressful and you know for the most part so crushing endeavor right no one wants to be at home no one wants to be away from their friends not being able to go out and party and all that sort of stuff no one wants that so i understand the sentiment of trying to save your summer but in the beginning save our summer was sort of like when the government was saying oh let's get football back so we can raise the country's morale when the numbers are really sp spiking right we were kind of taking over the free thirty thousand people death sort of count it sort of made things really odd like why would you want to save our summer when we have like other things to worry about domestically but you know again ibifa is this whole ecosystem uh people rely on those jobs the hospitality industry of there is massive of course nightlife industry there is massive too um and you know people rightly had you know plans that they had put in place for the summer holidays that completely been up upended you can't blame them for wanting to rescue some parts of it but unfortunately the spanish government have or the abifa government has basically said no events are going to happen again um this year partly because there's no vaccine so they have to just be you know strict about that and say until we get a vaccine we can't really take a risk of having people inside big mega clubs that you, you know when covid wasn't around they would sort of oversell them anyway so I imagine when they've been out of business for three or four months they're going to want to get their money back so it's probably a good thing they came out and just said it um obviously pending a vaccine being invented in the next six months or so but it's just from a bbc article it says i for clubs will not open this year it says um djs and club owners and party goers have been crossing their fingers for ibifa to open in 2020 um now the Balearic government have said nightclub venues cannot open their doors until next year at the earliest according to local media a local paper says the government has ruled out keeping the ban throughout 2021 until there's a coronavirus vaccine or treatment hi ibifa and, and how do you say usha ushla Ushla, Ushala, have you pronounced that? Are among the big venues to take part. So it's a statement from the Night League. It says, Dear friends, following the news of Balearic governments uh, that no clubs will be open at the big, uh, did not be for this season, it is with a heavy heart that we announce that we will no longer, no events will be taking place at Haya Bifa and wherever that Ushaya venue is. This is clearly a deep impact for all of us. However, we understand that this is the correct decision taking account the situation caused by COVID 19. Now, this is a time to act reasonably responsibly sorry uh above any other consideration putting the health and safety of our guests artists and team first this is the hardest challenge we've have faced since we started our incredibly journey but now 
uh, more than ever, we are determined to work towards delivering our biggest season in 2021 when we look forward to welcoming you back again. We send you all our love and gratitude at this time. The Night League owner of those fur places. So obviously, you know, devastating news if you're someone that goes to IB for a lot. You're going to be, you know, super gutted. I think, although there's part of me that's sort of like, did you really think you were going to be able to go to IB for this year, considering everything that's happened in the world? That was a really full-hearted thing to believe in or to get your hopes up like it's just not like it just it wasn't going to happen especially when you look at some of the other countries that have sort of you know come out of COVID-19 the best um they're still not up and running fully um in the same way that it w you would require for Abiva to be you know at least manageable or at least worthwhile for people that host those events right it's not worth them even if they could open they would probably have to open to limited capacity but can you legitimately put on a limited capacity at beef a club night especially the mega clubs the amount of bar staff you gotta pay and security and shit it's gonna you know just running costs alone is not gonna make that worth it so um yeah the optim it was optimistic to say the least to think that you're gonna be able to rave this summer yeah uh, the statement says that the, the, the repeat the statement what i said um um, it continues here, says the tourist driven economy on the island has suffered uh, because of the pandemic and some cl hopeful club owners have been selling tickets for events to take place in the of October. <laughs> it had been a long awaited announcement with much of the nightlife industry pushing for permission to open the no social distancing measures in place. The ban seems to cover big indoor venues and it's unclear um, that the rules will be around outdoor beach clubs too. Wayne Lineker, who owns O Beach Abifa, posted after the government announced to say that he will be open opening we're here and we're gonna have some fun so i guess wayne lineker doesn't care he's gonna go with it for it anyway um we can travel to spain blah, blah. so yeah i'm interested to see what happens um obviously the the statement is quite clear no events but again I've, it's obviously pending a treatment or a vaccine so that might change things but oh, i don't know like what's the consumer confidence going to be like will people actually want to go to a club now with covid still around um because I think we've seen that in the States, right? I think most restaurants reported a big spike, especially the ones that reopened in some of the southern states. They operate, they, you know, reported big spikes in sales and queues around the block. And then after the third week, people started to become a bit more, you know, nervous and hesitant, obviously due to the numbers spiking up again in some of the states. But um, consumer confidence is going to be slow to rebuild, isn't it? from the government to the businesses themselves it's not going to be an easy overnight thing just because someone says you can reopen doesn't mean anyone's going to come so um yeah it's sad to see man it really is um in one way sad to see another way i think it's also a good time to sort of reboot and refresh ibifa and what it means right? i watch i've never been to ibifa but i watched so many of those i've watched for years the ims ibifa panel discussions where they essentially talk about the same topic right how commercial ibifa has become over the years um how it's kind of lost its essence right it's not the ibifa of old right um the ibifa that fucking george michael used to go to back in the day it's not the same one so they want to get back that vibe right that sort of hippie sort of like um wonder lusty you know whatever vibe that they had they want to bring that back so this is probably the best way to do it because everyone playing then at the moment at barbecues or like at smaller venues they're going to be local djs right local promoters who have been there for a while but have probably been overlooked because you know their names aren't solomon and marco corolla but now that those guys can't come um or they're unable to come or unwilling to come um it's probably going to give those smaller people smaller djs um with kind of less clout and less notoriety a chance to circuit their skills and then hopefully when the bigger mega clubs do reopen there's just balance because i'm not saying you know they should just be mega they're not saying they should only be underground clubs and no mega clubs no make mega clubs for the casual tourists but also have some balance so that the smaller venues have you know local people playing who get the vibe of the islands and can sort of like you know uh relay that back on the decks so you can only hope that happens going forward but yeah surprising um, big news and a club in front for anyone hoping to go to Ibiza it's not gonna happen this year unfortunately my friends it's not going to happen anyway that's your excellent single show episode number three three zero thanks so much for tuning in as per usual 
if it's your first time listening please make sure you hit that like button and hit subscribe as well so you can be notified of new shows that are coming up if you've got any comments regarding what i spoke about of course write it down below in the box and if you're listening via the podcast app of course leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends um if you want to also follow me on twitter and instagram please sure you do um my profiles are agostino zinga all one word on twitter and on instagram you can find the links again in the description box of this youtube video of your favorite podcasting app but until then see you guys very very soon take care be safe peace